In a world where work exists without the workers, one boy strives to make a difference in it all. Provoked by the death of his father, he leaves the countryside to escape while taking a taste of what city life has to offer. As he neglects his past, yet embraces his future, how could he ever manage the present? Hello! And welcome to our channel. Today we'll recap and review a Mexican sci-fi indie film released in 2008 called Sleep Dealer. Let's check it out. The world has become a technologically, corporately authoritarian and dystopian nightmare where underpaid yet overcharged migrant workers are essentially used as slave labor not for their physical bodies but for their minds. They are the sleep dealers. Called so in due essence of their work using up all their energy to the point of exhaustion. They are attached via wires to internodal networks connected to the global economy that make them virtually and remotely, yet unskillfully control robot workers working beyond the border in place of themselves as a means for their employers to prevent their emigration to the United States. One of these workers on the brink of collapse is a young boy named Memo, and this is his story. Memo is a savvy young man whose skills within a world overly reliant on technology can be utilized if need be. Living with his family in a small pueblo in Santa del Rio, Mexico, he reluctantly works with his father at his small farm, picking up water from the dam at a hugely steep price. Their livelihood is unsustainable just for the resources they need to maintain it alone. Yet Memo's father does it out of his love for work. He resists technological advancements, relying heavily on conventional farming methods regardless of a huge net loss. Inside a shack, Memo constructs a rudimentary radio connected towards a satellite dish outside in order to hear conversations from afar. He listens to unique tales and stories he otherwise wouldn't hear about from his father's small farm. The radio that he's made entirely from scratch is his way of escaping the dullness of farming and his brother's indifference towards his talents. But little does he know, his desire for connection with complete strangers will lead on to disconnecting him from his own family, ending in ways more catastrophic than he could have imagined once he hears a distinct chatter indicating military sources have tracked his radio's location at the water concession. One day, Memo and his brother head over to their uncle's to pay a visit. Watching TV, he sees an advertisement for TrueNode, an online network that documents memories and experiences for consumption. Switching channels, he sees another ad, this time by Del Rio Water, discussing how aquatic terrorism is wreaking havoc against their assets and their methods of diffusing them. Through employing professional pilots tasked to remotely take the terrorists down, Del Rio Water Security is a force to be reckoned with. And Memo indeed reckons it when he sees on the commercial his Pueblo and the satellite dish he connects his radio with. Running back together, the two brothers desperately tried to stop the attack somehow, but it was too late, as the remote aircraft assigned to discard the compromised asset under suspicion of terrorism has already done its task. The actual terrorism committed, however, was yet to be done, which was the condemnation of an innocent man who emerges from the rubble of the shack. Bloodied and wounded, he crawls in full view of the rookie pilot in charge of taking him out. This is close to completing his first assignment, and at the same time, his first blood. He looks at his victim eye to eye, too hesitant to fire, but orders are orders, and he did what needed to be done. Sometime after the attack, Memo weeps in remorse among the ruins as his brother blames him fully for their old man's untimely death. Facing accountability for his actions while unable to actually face his family for being partially, if not fully responsible for his old man's murder, he runs with tail between legs and leaves his Pueblo for Tijuana, a city bordering the United States, to be the replacement breadwinner for his family. On his way, he meets aspiring writer Luz. They travel together on a bus en route to Tijuana. Seated together, Memo takes notice of the widgets attached to her arms, to which she reveals they are nodes that she had installed. Interested, he asks to exchange for more information on how to acquire them for himself with the least amount of expense possible, since he's clearly never had any before. She tells him he needs a Coyotech, a person who could install nodes on him in order to be hooked up to the internodal system. After introducing themselves to each other, Luz's eyes light up once she gets a glimpse of Memo's origins. He intrigues her, so she begins to write about him. Upon arrival, Memo attempts to settle in the hustle and bustle of Tijuana, proclaiming itself as the city of the future. He could be able to acquire more opportunities than he could back at home, only for his ignorance to fall flat on him once he gets mugged. 
Forced to cut his losses at the edge of the city, he is welcomed by two homeless old men to sleep at a derelict shack. Meanwhile, possessing a true note account, Luz dispenses her stories in it, appealing to readers to take part in her journeys in written form. And among them is a patron very interested in hearing Memo's story. Her audience's curiosity of the subject of her writings further sparks her, thus prompting her to find him to see if she could in any way do him favors after learning of his troubles the prior night. At a bar while searching for Koyotex, Memo learns that Luz is a writer, or at least aspires to be one. Both aren't native to Tijuana, so once she asked him why he's in town to begin with, his response was as typical an excuse any migrant worker would make, while omitting that he's actually doing it to make up for indirectly killing his dad. After having their small talk, Luz takes Memo for his node job, revealing that she's doing it herself. Surprising Memo, Luz tells him that the guy she got her own node jobs from was her ex, who was a Koyotek himself. Afterwards, Memo heads out to the networked facilities, the sleep dealer factories. Memo is connected through the factory's network to be employed as a construction worker in California. Applying himself, Memo does his job rather easily, getting the hang of it faster and better than most. After his shift is over, he calls his brother back home in Santa Ana, who still resents him after running away, and he even deduces that Memo's job is his ticket out of home for good. His brother's grudge falls short, however, once Memo sends him his family's share of his paycheck. Despite the excess taxes, and other sorts of charges, it does put a smile on his brother's face, and by proxy, his family. Thus, the brother demands more, which means Memo needs to work more away from home. Win-win. Afterwards, Luz transcribes on her True Note account the feelings she's developed for Memo. Her latest article recalls her recent experiences with him, like how she writes about how he misses home but not enough to go back for it, though she's hesitant to address these same feelings directly. Her computer mocks her for it, and this happens possibly every time she writes about Memo. With that in mind, Luz would rather tell the truth to a machine while keeping on lying to him. The very same story Luz transcribed is read by her top patron, who happens to be the rookie pilot that was issued the order to dispose of Memo's father. Rudy, a node worker himself, makes use of the information he acquires through Luz's writings of Memo to track him down. His motives are yet to be fully understood, but whatever they are, he demands to know more about this young man. At work, Memo is driven away from his past, but with Luz, he reconnects with it. So she takes advantage of this by taking him to a riverside so he can further disclose more information about himself as demanded by her customer. Work tires Memo, so Luz comforts him until they both end up kissing. However, his escapism begins to concern him once a worker at the factory collapses from exhaustion, thus describing his worries to Luz as they are in bed together. Afterwards, she reveals to her True Note account while still excluding everything from Memo that she's written about him. He has told her so much while she so little, even while they literally connect with each other. Once Memo tells her one last thing about his dad, she transcribes her story about his story one last time. Rudy receives all the information he needs, knowing fully well he did indeed murder an innocent man. Yet, his parents praise him as a hero for what was needlessly murder. Once at last, having everything he needed, he drove down south to Mexico in search of the sleep dealer. After Luz sent away her writings to Rudy, she went out. Memo pays her place a visit unannounced, but once being led inside by her neighbor, he stumbles upon her True Note account and finds the writings that she's made about him. While being shocked with what his girlfriend had been hiding from him all this time, Luz enters the room without warning, seeing Memo with a dark expression. Attempting to bargain with him, Luz states that his stories need to be heard. He storms out of the room, leaving the writer in shame. Indeed, his stories were heard, but whether they were needed to be, that's still up in the air. His girlfriend has betrayed him while he has forsaken his family. Memo can't come back to either out of disappointment and remorse respectively, so he has nowhere else to go but to deal back at the factory, where his entire story is now. Expressing his regrets through working himself 12-hour shifts to death and spending his nights in hedonist pleasure, his life has become aimless. A man too stuck in the past without a future to look forward to. Memo falls asleep on the job, prompting him to leave his shift early. After work, he unwinds at the riverside where he and Luz used to date. Laying down, he reads a letter that she wrote, with her true node memories of him attached. Asserting that she indeed came to Tijuana to write stories down to connect with people, it can't be denied she did connect with him. Luz went too far with what she did, relieving Memo that she's at least willing to admit it. Finally arriving from beyond the border, Rudy finds Memo dining at his usual place 
Ares thanks to Luz's writings. Introducing himself, he slowly explains his background to let the child of his victim understand why he needed to do what he did. Upon realizing this, Memo bolts away to escape the other half responsible for his father's death. Rudy follows Memo and backs him into a corner, not because he's trying to hurt him, but quite the opposite. He apologizes to him and demands that he wants to help. As the pilot gets off the bus, the sleep dealer is confused with his offer, reluctantly accepting it. Returning to Luz for a consult, Memo demands that she hooks Rudy up to the network back at the sleep dealers in order to assist him in doing the favor the pilot promised. Though Luz hesitates, her new ex reminds her that her patron crossed lines just to make it up to Memo. So why can't they? As they connect him, Rudy remotely uses his jet aircraft for an unauthorized mission towards the Santa Ana Del Rio Dam. Del Rio Water Security immediately issues an order to intercept Rudy's unauthorized flight, but there's only so much they could do. Memo recalls how his dad used to throw stones against the water concession, and this is his way of telling his father that he can finally rest in peace, knowing that the dam is finally blown up into pieces, though by the very same guy that turned him into bits. Santa Ana finally has a renewed, abundant, and inexpensive water source once more, though it's unsure if Del Rio water will leave it that way. His remaining family is happy to welcome him back into their pueblo, but he can't come back now that they have a future of their own. Instead, he intends to stay in Tijuana to build his own. Rudy escapes further south now that he has become an aqua terrorist himself, while Memo settles down at his new frontier. At the edge of the city, he builds himself a small farm of his own to continue his father's memory, a future he fights for, rooted in his past, which can only be done if he connects both. This film eerily describes the dystopian aspects of modern globalization. Effectively disguised as an indie sci-fi film, it executes this perfectly well. It also features a couple prominent themes, such as representation of Hispanic culture and a message confronting colonialism, past and contemporary, occupying Latin Americans and their heritage. Though not everyone involves themselves with identity politics, this film serves to identify and address that issue, knowing that its basis stems from real world examples. In order to raise further awareness regarding Regarding this issue, the film is an ambitious social commentary, attempting to establish connection towards its target audience, not just limited to the Latin sphere, but the modern world in general. Please subscribe to our channel to be notified when we upload, and don't forget to suggest movies that you want us to recap in the future in the comments down below.